Hi, Community Theater. Uh, welcome to our last uh, set of presenters today. I am super excited to introduce some more college students Please. for you. Then the next breakout session will begin in 15 minutes. That was unplanned. <laughs> um, at, these uh, gentlemen are from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the University of Berkeley, California. Uh, I'm going to let them get started. Please help me in welcoming them to the stage. Hello. Hello. Hey, everyone. So we're here to talk about how we use Docker for rapid prototyping at our most recent hackathon, Tree Hacks. And so I'm Andrew. This is Ethan. This is Paul. And this is Kyle. Ethan and I are both freshmen at UC Berkeley. And Kyle and Paul are both juniors at UC Santa Cruz. And we met up at Tree Hacks this year, 2019. And so when we came into Tree Hacks, we didn't exactly have like a concrete idea of what we wanted to do, of course. And so we really had to do a lot of brainstorming. At first, we looked at all the different sponsors that were at Tree Hacks, and we looked at all the different categories that um, were provided for this event. And we also looked at all the different ideas um, and projects from previous hackathons. And in the end, we came to the conclusion that we wanted to work on something that we all weren't necessarily familiar with. And so in the end, we decided we wanted to work on something that was related to cybersecurity. Um, for Ethan and I, because this was our first hackathon, we were pretty inexperienced to the hackathon scene. And so Kyle and Paul were really just great mentors during this entire process. I just want to say thank you to both of you guys. And um, so yeah, in the end, our project is um, called NetGuard. And I'll let Ethan talk about what our project does. All right, so the issue we found was that um, IoT devices, uh, basically hackers uh, hack into IoT devices with default passwords and use those devices to access other devices on the network. And um, according to G2 World, like 15% of IoT devices still have default passwords. So they're really vulnerable and people can just use them to create really uh, complex, I mean, really large botnets that can just take down entire servers by themselves. So how our pro the cybersecurity attack we decided to prevent was DDoSing. And basically, we wrote a daemon in uh, Python that monitors incoming network traffic in the background. On And we tested it on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so basically, what it did was it listened on the network for uh, an increase in network traffic. And it closed all of the ports on the Raspberry Pi if there were 10 requests per second. And it sent when it detected this increase in network traffic, it sent the device owner an SMS with information about the attack. And it also sent an SSH, a custom SSH key to reconfigure the Raspberry Pi. And we used a technology called Remote It, which allowed you to SSH into the Raspberry Pi while all the, clo all the ports were closed. So you could securely SSH, and like if you if you checked it like four hours later, uh, all the ports would still be closed, but you could still securely SSH, and the hackers could not get into the Raspberry Pi. So every time the increase in net, every time there was an attack, it would upload that information to an Azure database, and that Azure database was used to as another way to detect like blacklisted IPs so that we didn't just have to uh, we didn't just have to detect DDoS attacks and uh, we could use the blacklisted information to as another way to prevent uh, cybersecurity attacks. Uh, so some of the or the technologies that we ended up using were uh, as some of them were already mentioned uh, Twilio for the uh, text message alerts uh, remote it to uh, send the SSH key and set up the secure SSH on the device. Um, Microsoft Azure to uh, deploy our messaging server and for the database. And um, of course, uh, we use Docker for uh, uh, prototyping the, like some of the first versions of our pro project. Cool. Um, so as probably like most of you know, hackathons, um, you're working on with little time, uh, you 
are working with little sleep and also like pretty low manpower for people, um, you really have to kind of have to decide pretty quickly and uh, how to best use your time. And you want to you want that to be used very efficiently. Like you don't want um, any idle time if you want to get your project uh, going as quickly as possible. So um, with Docker, we were able to, um, for example, our daemon ran on a Raspberry Pi. So what that meant that was that we had to rent a Raspberry Pi and we had to set it up. And of course, as um, you know, problems always arise, we ended up having a big problem with our Raspberry Pi. We couldn't set it up. We were like running around trying to find a keyboard and mouse and then trying to uh, research how to do a headless install and then it wouldn't connect to the Wi-Fi, um, things like that. So while I was out running around trying to get all that set up, the other guys were able to um, spin up uh, containers that closely simula simulated um, the, uh, the Raspberry Pi environment um, and kind of start uh, building things out uh, while I was working on that. So um, with that, we were able to just uh, begin writing code pretty much immediately without having to wait for me to set things up. And also what that allowed was for multiple people to work at the same time um, instead of like kind of just waiting for one machine to become available, so. And alluding to something that Paul mentioned earlier was we were able to, while Paul was working on getting the Raspberry Pi set up, the ultimate production environment that our device side daemon would be running in, we were able to, in lieu of that, have a very realistic testing environment that allowed us to rapidly prototype our device side daemon, as well as the backend API that we use to handle all the messaging. So I was on a Windows 10 laptop. These guys were on Mac OS. And that we were deploying to two um, types of Linux distributions. Raspbian, the device that where the device side daemon would be deployed, and a Ubuntu VM on Azure App Service where our backend API would be deployed. So as you can tell, especially in my situation where I was working on a Windows laptop, our development environment was looking very different than where we we're going to be able to deploy. And we only really had one shot um, to be able to judge like how our project would perform. Because at the end of these hackathons, when we're done hacking, we present to industry professionals like yourself. And if we're not able to guarantee that our API is going to act in the same way on Azure as it does on our local laptops, or if the device side daemon would not perform in this with the same behavior, you know, like deterministically as if it was doing on our own laptops, then we'd be really stressed out and we probably would have failed in front of the judges. So we're also, because being on different operating systems, we were able to collaborate on the same source code without needing to have the same configurations of all of our libraries and dependencies. So at one point or another, for example, we were all collaborating on the Flask API on the back end that was handling like talking with the Twilio and remoted APIs, doing all the alerts. And we didn't, we all had different versions of Python installed on our machines. And if any of you have ever like worked on trying to like sync versions of Python across multiple machines, um, especially at this point we didn't know what Python environment managers were, it would have been a pain, especially with like two hours of sleep. So at Docker we were able to, you know, basically fulfill this promise that Docker makes that you can have this shared environment that will run exactly the same regardless of the type of like operating system that you're running Docker on. So we could say, oh, we all want Python 3.7 and regardless of the local version of Python we had on our machines, we were able to get the same result. So as like kind of we've alluded to throughout this talk, besides for deployments in the, during the development and prototyping process, we were able to save so many hours of just saying, oh, here's this really lightweight um, environment that we'll test our application in that is stateless and we can able to tear down and spin back up really easily and rapidly prototype. And specifically with our backend API, this was compared to like where our experience level at the time was kind of really pushing our limits. None of us had ever worked on deploying a REST API on Microsoft Azure before. So besides figuring out like the right, the right service to use, there's also like if any of you ever deployed on the cloud, there's a myriad of deployment options that if you don't know all the jargon, it can be really confusing. So with Docker, it allowed us to um, automate a lot of the configuration and essentially say, okay, Azure, we want you to 
to basically deploy this API from this Docker image. We're not going to go into the Azure portal and specify the different run times that we want or a lot of this other configuration that was frankly super confusing to us. Um, Docker made a lot more sense to be able to step past all those processes. Also, instead of saying like, oh, here's the, like, the specific file that we want Azure to run that spins up our Flask API, here's just the port that we want it to run on, and Azure was smart enough to be able to do the Docker run command on itself. So this was really impactful, again, because we were able to have the same behavior for our remote API as we were having on our local development machines. So when, by the time the judges came around, and like in multiple rounds, we were able to, with assurance, say, okay, our API is going to perform in more or less the same manner in production than it would like when we're testing it on our local machines. And with having so little sleep and this being so much beyond our skill level at the time, any type of assurances like that were really helpful. So this whole experience of competing at this hackathon and using Docker and competing in a space that we were super unfamiliar with, in this case, IoT network security, none of us had ever taken a networking class and probably couldn't even explain what TCP meant. So this was definitely outside of our domain. It was super impactful. Um, you know, for Ethan and Andrew, this was their first hackathon experience. So just kind of like getting experience coding outside of the classroom, doing something really applied where you could be a lot more creative. Often in CS curriculum, as many of you probably remember, you're given a project that's supposed to be complete over a week with very specific guidelines. In a hackathon, much like in real life, there's a lot of ambiguity of how is like, how are we going to accomplish this? What should we even be tackling? What are like we have a problem that we want to address, like what's the type of project that we're going to solve it with? So that was a really great kind of like 48 hour experience in a lot of the problems that you face like IRL. Also, we had never worked together and had very little exposure working in teams outside of classrooms where again, you have very specific kind of like deadlines and goals. So working with other engineers, we found to be really difficult. These are the things that you don't learn in the classroom. Um, understanding that you should use Git correctly and not just all push the master, especially when you don't know how to resolve merge conflicts, um, was like a really great experience. And you're all, not great at the time, but a really great in retrospect learning experience. Um, also just like, on the topic of ambiguity, the importance of adapting and pivoting. So there were like, uh, you know, while we ultimately are very satisfied with the project that we came up with, this wasn't the initial envision. We were going to use all these different APIs, all these different services. We saw this really cool like Azure IoT logging service that would have um, essentially done a lot of what our device side daemon ended up doing, but we just quickly realized that we were in over our heads. So learning like when to pivot from you know, ideas and when to realize, okay, we don't have the resources, in this case, our education and amount of sleep to be able to learn any particular technology, that's been really impactful. And a you know, great experience of, oh, if you pivot early and like, don't you know, like, give in to some cost when it comes to your technical choices, you can actually come up with a much better end result than if you um, decided to stay the course. And also, maybe you know, most importantly, also in terms of technical skill, is we became very familiar with Docker, at least in terms of like what we, you know, I would expect a student would know. Um, so I had worked with—I was the only one who had worked with Docker um, before. I just doing relatively trivial projects like Dockerizing, like create React app or something. You know, really simple, like four-line Docker file. And I didn't have to go learn anything about Docker networking, didn't have to learn about volumes or anything like that, or really deploying it on a, like, an automated manner. And this project was completely different. We had to go into the weeds of Docker networking because this is, you know, ultimately a IoT network security project. So we learned, okay, how do Docker containers handle networking at a basic level? Because we were having to do a lot of debugging around that, which was very difficult. And I still don't fully understand it, but much more I do. Also, um, because unlike most hackathon projects, which are just like a single app, this was essentially like three different services. Our device side daemon, our REST API, and the database, that, um, the relational database that was like securing, um, like recording like the attack information. So in order to have all these services, like be able to test them together, we learned Docker Compose. And understanding a lot of the networking issues around that and also like the file formats. It was just a really good test in learning a very complicated technology very quickly. And it's something that we've all taken into our personal and professional projects since then. 
And we, you know, one last bit of uh, you know thanks is we were very lucky in that Docker Inc. had a team of engineers who were at the event who were on call even at like three or four a.m. when we were doing some of this that we could just ping them on Slack and they would uh, slide through and be able to help us out. So that was really invaluable learning from industry professionals, both associated with and not with Docker. It was just a great, you know, like it allowed us to essentially accomplish this project. And Docker Inc. was also very gracious in extending invitations to this conference because um, of the, like the relationship we had built working with them at this event. So yeah, in summary, we learned a lot of uh, by mistakes and a lot of sleepless um, stress that we've been able to take like into our, the rest of our academics, internships, and just kind of like some life choices in general. So thank you all very much for listening. Uh, we have a few minutes to answer questions about our hacks, background, uh, what we plan to do next. And yeah, thank you guys very much. If you have a question, I can bring a microphone to you. One question over here. Hold on one second. So you 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 chose to use Kubernetes. Uh, is there a reason you could have just used Swarm, or how did they, how did you make that choice? Um, so we didn't end up using Kubernetes for this project. I totally might have misspoke. Uh, we ended oh. up using Docker Compose for our um, oh, just Docker Compose. You know what? I think I might actually have it confused with the previous project. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've heard Kubernetes dropped yeah. a few times at this yeah. event, so I wouldn't blame you. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions? Yep. So, what are you planning to do next? Ooh, so this last week we all re went back into the GitHub repo that we all contributed to, saw all the code was super spaghetti, kind of saw where our like one, two hours of sleep um, were there. Ideas we'd like to have is this would be really fun to have um, the device side daemon be wrapped up in maybe some type of like um, package you can install via a packet manager that can just, you know, run and actually handle and like, um, to, like identify real life attacks. So a lot of what we were doing was kind of like a proof of concept of this is something that could be possible. What we'd really like to do when, when we're not in midterms and finals is um, maybe release like an open source package that uh, handles at least the device side part where you can also pass in like your Twilio um, credentials and remote credentials and it handles all the back end parts for you. So kind of like maybe making an open source project out of this and learning like getting a lot more feedback from professional engineers about like what their thoughts about our approach. Any other questions? One more? Okay, last one. Can we, can we get the reference to your GitHub project? Uh, your GitHub project? Yeah, so uh, our project is currently, uh, we have a, uh, it's on dev post. Um, so if you just search uh, just NetGuard TreeHacks 2019, I think you should be able to find the posts and then um, our GitHub repositories on there. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much.